Look, thanks to the Guild um, for inviting Meridian to participate. Thanks to Mel and her team for organising. I'd also like to say hello to John, who just presented, um, and also to Phil Chapman and Natalie Siriani, who are presenting after me. Um, normally, we'd be saying hello in the same room. But look, um, as was evident from John's presentation, we can still get our messages across in a, in, in a virtual environment. And I'd also like to just thank everyone who's attending for attending. Um, you're all very busy people. And um, I'd like to just take um, an opportunity from a personal point of view to thank community pharmacy and the people who work in it um, and have been working in it for years, but particularly over the last two years, um, the, the support you've given to the community around you has been enormous. And certainly um, I'd like to um, pass on a personal thanks um, for what you've done for our community um, here in Melbourne. Um, we can't cover too much today. The session, I've got about 25 minutes left. I'd like to leave a bit of time for some questions after. Um, I'm talking about business obligations in your pharmacy businesses and uh, pharmacy is a highly regulated um, uh, profession, um, both in respect of things like privacy, um, how pharmacies can be owned and operated. Um, there's uh, location rules. Um, there's rules in relation to poisons regulation. There's a highly regulated profession. I'm gonna to touch on a few things today um, that I think if you can just scroll down there so people can see that, Daniel. Um, can they see that whole screen? Possibly. Yes, they should be, they should be able to, yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm gonna to focus today on um, data collection and privacy. Talk a little bit about your premises, um, the location, goodwill, and some things that you should take note of in making sure that you look after your lease and you secure um, properly your location goodwill. Um, I'll talk a little bit about ownership regulations um, and how they can impact on some of the commercial arrangements that pharmacy owners enter into uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And also talk a little bit about um, issues that can arise in pharmacy partnerships, whether they be your traditional partnership of people or whether they be corporatized kind of partnerships with companies and unit trusts involved. Um, if you can please skip over there, Daniel. Okay. Look, um, first of all, I think it's worthwhile saying that pharmacies um, like other businesses use uh, an increasing array, array of software platforms um, to operate their businesses. They have dispense and point of sale systems uh, platforms to record um, interventions that you undertake with patients, both for programs run by the government, government funded uh, programs like um, diabetes and meds checks, I and mean, also for privately funded, sponsor funded um, programs that are all about educating patients in relation to medication management and adherence. So there's all sorts of platforms that are being utilised by pharmacies. And it's fair to say that commercial entities that uh, run these platforms or provide them through their service providers, whether they be franchisors or banner groups or wholesalers, um, or even data analytics firms, they're very keen on capturing as much data as they can, because we do live, as we all know, in a data-driven world. Um, it's worthwhile just saying that as an introduction, because I think that what's happened in recent years is that Pharmacies, both pharmacies and the people who work in them and also consumers um, are sometimes not totally aware of what data is being captured, collected and how it's being used. Um, you're the repository of all sorts of data, particularly in relation to patients, because you're providing a health service, obviously. So some of that data is what you call personal information under the Privacy Act. Much of it's sensitive information. And you need to take great care, obviously, in how you collect it, what patients are informed of, and how that data is stored and used, and who accesses it. We're also seeing in the marketplace increasing um, use of um, health applications, applications that are consumer facing, that people can use to interact with their pharmacies and also banner groups um, for things like loyalty programs, um, ordering prescription ordering from medicines um, you know providing prescriptions online and having dispense remotely we're seeing more and more of this in pharmacy and also we're seeing a prevalence of telehealth generally all of this means that 
um, there's an increased risk of inadvertent privacy breach and data breach because of just the sheer volume of data being collected by pharmacy. Um, Daniel, if you could please tick over to the next slide. I wanted to run through some privacy golden rules. Um, you'll all have your own privacy policies um, as you're required to under the Privacy Act and the Australian Privacy Principles. Um, I really recommend that you review it and check it to see whether it's still current. That's just one golden rule. Ch check your privacy policy. Sometimes these are provided to you by your banner group or franchisor um, uh, to assist you in running your business. Sometimes your industry associations like the Pharmacy Guild will provide you with a template. You may have seen a privacy expert, whether they be a lawyer or someone else to help you with that. But certainly it's worthwhile reviewing in light of perhaps change circumstances in the pharmacy. One of the golden rules in any, for any business, um, whether it be our businesses, legal services providers or any other business is really only to collect the information you need to provide the service that you're providing. Um, I know that sounds really obvious, but it's amazing how quite often in some of the programs that are being delivered through pharmacy, sometimes more information is being collected than is absolutely necessary. Now with publicly funded programs, that, that is programs funded by the government um, through um, the community pharmacy agreements, um, as you know, the program rules govern the kinds of information that you need to um, provide, collect and provide to the government. So there's not much you can do about that. And, you know, as long as you're using the privacy collection notices supplied in the course of delivering um, those programs, it's okay. But in some other programs and some other things that are done in pharmacy, um, whether they be vaccinations or other sponsor funded um, health services, sometimes it's not clear that you necessarily need to collect all the information you're collecting. It's also not clear exactly what information is being accessed. Um, I think that one golden rule, one thing I would um, recommend is that um, you, you try to come to an understanding of the entities, the commercial entities um, who are your key stakeholders, what, what information they access and what's being, what they're taking out of the pharmacy by way of personal data. Um, it's pretty clear that with loyalty type programs, and we're seeing more and more of this in pharmacy as we've seen in other businesses, with loyalty programs, um, you know, consumers expect that banner groups, you know, franchisors and pharmacy owners, pharmacy businesses are going to need to collect personal information because we enter into loyalty program arrangements with um, loyalty program operators all the time as consumers. So there's nothing wrong with that. And the provision of that data to a you know, by a consumer and its collection by a pharmacy is perfectly legitimate, provided that the consumer knows at the time what that data is going to be used for. So I do recommend having a review of the collection notices that are used uh, when you register, for example, a patient or a customer for a loyalty program and make sure that you understand what, um, what information of that customer is being accessed and how it's being used. And typically you'll see it's being used to offer a range of services and products to the consumer um, by way of email and text and things like that. And um, so just be aware of the privacy collection notices and the privacy policies of those who you partner with in delivering those sorts of programs. Um, for clinical programs, um, we do see, uh, you have to collect patient sensitive data, obviously, um, in delivering a health service and collecting uh, health information, which is sensitive information under the Privacy Act about patients. What I've been concerned about in the work we do with various clients is um, the number of times you see that um, there's the potential for access to patient personal health information by those who don't really need it. Um, commercial entities have every um, right and desire to collect vast amounts of data for analytical purposes, um, you know, looking at, um, I guess, uh, trends in um, you know, demographics and what, what sort of medicines and other things, what sort of services people are buying or wanting. But there's no reason why that data can't be 
de-identified and aggregated in a way where personal um, patient information about their health uh, the medicines they're taking is not supplied to commercial third parties. So I would um, recommend that you check with your stakeholder partners um, about what sort of data they are collecting in relation to patient's information. Um, because quite often it can simply be aggregated. Um, everyone's aware of the Australian privacy principles and I won't go on too much about those other than to provide some key messages which I've just done um, in relation to what can happen in pharmacy and just knowing that you're all busy people but perhaps just take a sanity check of some privacy practices within the pharmacy and make sure you're happy that it's all above board and uh, if there are any concerns you should raise those with with your with, with your partners and make sure that um, you address it or talk with others about it. Daniel, could we please move on? Thank you. Um, Natalie and, and Phil will talk with you shortly about um, leasing and, and rents um, and the value that pharmacy brings to, for example, shopping centres, um, the value that your premises bring to you as pharmacy owners. Um, we uh, frequently advise businesses about their lease terms, um, whether those terms reflect the agreement that was struck with a landlord or a, a managing agent, um, making sure that the lease is fair and reasonable as far as possible. Um, so we're quite familiar with um, the retail leasing scenario. We also act for landlords, but as far as um, pharmacy is concerned, location goodwill is critical. Um, not the least, one of the reasons, of course, is because um, of the location rules and the fact that um, attached to your business premises is your approval. So you hold um, an approval from uh, Medicare, from the government to dispense um, uh, pharmaceutical benefits under the PBS um, and that approval attaches to your premises. So they're very valuable and all the more reason to be very careful about your lease. Um, I think that what I wanna talk about here is just to remind people about some significant events in the life of your lease. One of them, of course, is rent reviews. Um, rent reviews come up every year and quite often you'll see that there's a fixed increase or a CPI increase and there's nothing remarkable, remarkable about that. That's quite normal. But you also see that there are market reviews that arise usually when there's an option to renew the lease. So you'll often see that there's either fixed or CPI reviews each year. And then when you get to the end of the term and there's an option, you'll see that there's a, a market review. About rent reviews, the retail leases laws in each of the states and territories, uh, for the most part, for mo in most of the states and territories, enable a landlord to only use one method of review. <coughs> Pardon me. In other words, in the old days before retail tenancy legislation, a landlord could say that the rent should increase to the new market rent, but it can't go below what the current rent is. That's called a ratchet clause. Ratchet clauses are generally prohibited by retail leasing um, legislation in each of the states and territories. I just wanted to remind people about that. If a landlord wants to review your rent to market on the renewal of the lease, then that's fine, but it means the rent can go up or down depending on what the market is doing. But just a reminder about market reviews. Um, the retail tenancies legislation also um, has a lot in it about outgoings and what kinds of outgoings um, can be charged to the to the pharmacy tenant or any retail tenant for that matter. And um, some things that some common themes here, because all the legislation is a bit different between the different states and territories, but common themes are things like um, usually land tax can't be recovered from tenants or if it's recovered, it can only be recovered on the basis that it's the only land that the landlord owns. Um, uh, landlords can't typically recover capital costs, um, their capital costs in outgoings numbers. So just be aware, be careful to, and they've also got to give you outgoing statements and comply with certain processes set out in the relevant legislation about giving you outgoing statements. Have a close look because sometimes some landlords aren't actually aware of what their obligations are. Um, and so what you can do is raise it with your landlord if you feel that 
um, you're being charged for something you shouldn't be charged for. Options to renew, critical. Um, I'm gonna point out two things here. The first is that diarise dates for the renewal of your lease um, and diarise them well in advance of the date by which you can first renew. And typically a lease will say that you can re renew um, no, no earlier than six months and no later than three months before the end of the term of the lease. Now, again, um, one of the things that people have trouble with and understandably is um, a, a tenant might say, well, I want to renew the lease, but I don't know what my rent's gonna be because there's a market review. I'm reluctant to renew my lease without knowing what I'm up for. Some of the states and territories in their retail leasing legislation enable the tenant to request an early market review ahead of the period when you have to exercise your option. So you can actually undertake that market review earlier, as long as you comply with the processes in that legislation. And if you do that, you can then exercise your option with certainty about what the market rent will be. Um, now the law is not the same in all the states and territories, but it's important you understand that because some tenants, and I've seen this happen, um, will write to their landlord or to the agent to say, yes, I want to exercise my option to renew because my lease is important to me, but um, I don't want to pay any more than this amount of rent and they'll set a rent figure. In other words, I'll propose a rental figure that might be a, a small increase on their current rent. Now, what will surprise some people is that um, doing that is not actually exercising an option. Um, the law is that, and the law is very strict on this. The law is that if you want to exercise an option to renew your lease, you have to comply strictly with the terms of the lease. And that means giving a notice in accordance with the lease, um, which means you've got to give it by a certain date, you've got to address it to the landlord, and you need to say, I'm going to, I want to exercise my option, full stop. That's how you exercise an option. If you, in the same communication, propose a rental, then what you're really doing is you're not actually exercising your option, you're proposing a lease for a new term at a certain rental. And what can happen, and I've seen this happen, is that they can then follow a negotiation between the landlord and the tenant about that proposed rental. Before you know it, the tenant, the, the option period's expired. And then the landlord might say, well, I've actually found another tenant. Um, and so you haven't exercised your option, so you know, see you later. Now, that might sound surprising, but it can happen. So just be aware of the dates for your option, your rights under the retail tenancies law. And if you, when you do go to exercise your option, make sure you do it strictly in accordance with your, with your lease. And I'd recommend getting some advice from someone like a Phil Chapman or someone like ourselves or, or, or your lawyer, because it's such an important part of your business. Um, I think probably they're the main points I wanted to talk about as far as your lease is concerned. Um, one other point, one other point. Um, sometimes tenants have problems with their landlords in that the landlords aren't fixing things that go wrong in the in the premises, you know, whether it be a leaking roof um, or something structural, water, water coming in um, you know, through the front door. There's a range of things that can happen in premises, including, for example, the aircon system not working properly. That can be quite um, annoying because um, you know, you can have a hot pharmacy and customers don't like that. Um, under some of the retail tenancy laws in the states and territories, landlords are required to keep the structure of the premises in good condition or condition at least consistent with what they were in when you took your lease in the first place. And also to make sure that services to the premises are working properly. So just be aware of your rights as far as those things are concerned, because those are the sorts of things that can come up from year to year um, for pharmacy businesses and and some landlords aren't prepared to be very helpful. So I uh, feel like it's a good, a good time for me to just make sure that you're aware of those rights. Um, Daniel, can we please move on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, look, uh, everyone's aware of um, the fact that um, pharmacy is in a, in a unique position in Australia in that I think it's the only health profession left where the business, the owner of the business must be a pharmacist or um, interests like a company or trust controlled by a pharmacist. Um, again, these are state-based, state and territory-based laws and they differ 
um, between the different jurisdictions, but they have this same theme that um, only pharmacy, only pharmacists or their controlled entities, uh, in some cases, close family members, can have any financial pecuniary or proprietary interest in the pharmacy business. Now, that's a good thing for pharmacy owners because it, it enables you to be independent proprietors um, of your businesses. And in fact, it puts the community in the expression community pharmacy because it truly remains a community focused profession um, where the people who provide services by and large are the people who own the business. Um, we've seen, we do a lot of work in the dental and medical professions um, it, from a business and corporate point of view. And we've seen in those professions, um, as you would have seen the corporatization of um, uh, some of those businesses, the aggregation of those businesses. And look, it's fair to say in my discussions with some dentists and doctors, it hasn't worked, it's worked for many, but it hasn't worked for some. And it doesn't necessarily work for the community. So you have these ownership laws, um, they're quite unique. Um, and that's hope they stay in place because community pharmacy should stay that way. Um, what I want to say about the ownership laws is that I guess with a lot of these things, there are catches. Um, and the catches can be, and the regulators are becoming increasingly regulators by that. I mean, for example, down here in Victoria, the Victorian Pharmacy Authority, or in New South Wales, the Pharmacy Council of New South Wales, but there are clearly there are regulators in every state and territory. Um, are becoming increasingly vigilant about commercial arrangements that um, perhaps go further than what would typically be the case in a commercial arrangement that could be perceived to give um, a non-pharmacy owner third party um, some kind of interest in the business that goes beyond what is appropriate given those ownership laws. The sorts of commercial arrangements I'm talking about are franchise and banner group agreements um, services agreements between a service provider and um, the pharmacy business, um, funding and lending type facility type agreements, particularly where the lending is privately sourced. Um, and we see sometimes, for example, in uh, medical center pharmacies where um, there's been funding by um, the medical center of a new pharmacy. Uh, some of the arrangements um, have, I guess, elements to them that the regulators are looking closely at. Um, be aware of that because when you go to sell your business or transfer an interest in the business or bring someone into partnership, the regulators will get to look at these documents. I wanna see some of these documents and the sorts of, thing, th sorts of things we're seeing that the regulators are picking up are things like, is the service fee in a services agreement a legitimate market-based fee? Um, is there, does the service provider have a unilateral right to vary the fees? Um, are there unfair rights to terminate for convenience? What are the termination rights and are they fairly mutual? What are the scope of the services? Are they clearly defined? Um, what the regulators wanna see essentially is that those services arrangements are on normal contractual arm's length terms. So just be aware of that. Um, franchise agreements have been around with pharmacy for a long, long time. Um, we know that um, the banner groups in many cases use franchise agreements um, because uh, under a franchise arrangement, the, the pharmacy owner remains the independent owner of the pharmacy and various fees are paid to the franchisor for the right to use intellectual property and for the benefit, for the, for the provision of other services. Now, those fees have to be fixed type fees. They can't be calculated by reference to the revenue or income of the pharmacy business. And most of you will, will know that. However, I did want to mention a few other things that are coming um, within the, I guess, the, the eyesight of the regulators. And they're things like um, excessive control of product being supplied, the medicines being supplied and other goods being supplied by the business. Um, the regulators are taking a closer look at those types of provisions. Um, they're looking at um, provisions dealing with the ownership of data and the collection of data um, because the regulators take the view that patient information should, should really belong to the pharmacy owner. And, and again, if you're entering into a commercial arrangement like this, you need to be careful to have those agreements reviewed because there, there are some surprising provisions in them. The other thing that regulators do tend to look at 
uh, things like um, rights of first refusal and options um, in those agreements to the to the franchisor, which um, vary between different agreements, but the regulators don't actually like them. Um, and while there's nothing I, I believe unlawful about them, um, it depends on how they're drafted. Um, I think I'm probably, we're running out of time here. It's eight o'clock on the dot. I know that I started a few minutes late. Um, I'm, I've got one more slide, I think, um, Daniel. So I'll try and be quick with this. Um, I wanted to just talk very briefly about what happens when you, end, when you bring someone in, into partnership with you or you establish a company to buy a pharmacy business and you've got um, one or two, a you know, couple of shareholders in it, a couple of directors in it. Um, once you enter into partnership with someone, whether it be through a company or trust or whether it be a traditional partnership, um, a whole range of fiduciary obligations will be binding on you as a director of the company or as a partner. And some of those fiduciary obligations, um, you sort of, people who are busy in their businesses don't actually think about them, not because they want to do anything wrong, but because they're too busy doing other things. And I, I wanted to just take this opportunity to mention a few of them, the sort of, uh, some of the implications of them. Um, you have a duty as a director of a company to act in the best interests of the company and all the shareholders. And, and you've got to be careful not to prefer your own interests ahead of the interests of others. So for example, um, if, you're, if you've got a pharmacy or if you've got several pharmacies and you've got a service entity providing services to those different pharmacies, uh, um, you've got to be careful that the way you provide those services is fair and reasonable and that you don't charge excessive fees or more fees to some pharmacies than others. Um, things like that can become problematic um, and, and it gives the opportunity for um, a partner to say, well, this is unfair. Also with financing, be careful about financial arrangements between um, your bank or financial institution and the, and the different pharmacy interests that you have because a pharmacy can be one pharmacy can be security for loans made to another pharmacy business. And so that security interest um, may not actually be beneficial to some of the owners in that pharmacy business that's given the security. You need to be careful that those things are entered into appropriately. And most of the banks deal with these things pretty carefully by making sure that the partners or the other owners agree and have confirmed or declared that there's financial benefit for them in entering into those arrangements. But just be aware that there can be issues arise. I mean, the other thing is if you are in, in a company with um, one or two other pharmacists um, and then you wanna buy another pharmacy, which is in the same area, um, but you wanna buy it with some other people or buy it on your own, um, there's this concept of corporate opportunity and your fellow shareholders and directors might say, well, you, you, know, you can't go off and buy that competing pharmacy over there, you've got to bring us along for the ride. Um, it means that you probably need to have those discussions up front and have good partnership and shareholder type agreements between you um, so that there are no surprises later. I just wanted to mention those things. Um, here's a summary of the things that I've talked about. I've gone a few minutes over time. There might be a couple of minutes for questions, Daniel, if um, I can ask. And uh, yeah, thanks again for the opportunity to Mel and the team for being part of this um, event. Great job, my brain hurts. There's been so much good stuff already, but I've got one question for you. You would come across a few instances in pharmacies where the legal obligations, maybe one or two, or maybe a lot, really aren't in good shape. That being the topic of your presentation, are your legal obligations in good shape? What's the most common one you come across that isn't in good shape that people really should be keeping an eye on? Look, I think probably um, a lack of having a decent partnership or shareholders agreement, an ownership agreement um, at the outset is probably the one that comes to mind because we do see um, occasionally where there's someone wants to leave a partnership or a company and move on or someone wants someone to leave. Um, those exit arrangements haven't been agreed. So that's probably one thing I would recommend people look at um, is just making sure that they've got, they're happy with their partnership agreement. If they haven't got one, to sit down with their partners or shareholders and, and make sure they do do that so that 
um, there's some certainty going forward as far as succession planning is concerned or, or exit. Uh, 